On Saturday, the nation's voters delivered their verdict on the Morrison government. Hello and welcome to Australia Votes. Could be a patchy result. We could see seats changing hands all over the board. This is a very difficult picture to pull apart. And at the moment, again, it doesn't look like the opinion polls today. How would you describe what you're seeing there in this once liberal heartland? Uh, well, it's a teal bath. And uh, I've got a feeling it's going to get worse before it gets worse. Well, North Sydney is another one of the seats which I'm... <laughs> it's, uh, my, my brain's burning a little bit. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this wasn't merely a rejection of the coalition. The dominance of the two main parties was shattered. Safe Liberal seat, two-term incumbent. Independent. You'd have to say we're heading towards a Labor government. Tonight, I've spoken to the Leader of the Opposition and the incoming Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, and I've congratulated him on his election victory this evening. Please welcome to the stage the man set to be the 31st Prime Minister of Australia. And I say to my fellow Australians, thank you for this extraordinary honour. Tonight, the Australian people have voted for change. So it should be all right. Yeah, sure. Okay. How are you going? Good, thanks. Thanks for doing this. No worries. Got Hawaii written on it. So. <laughs> Before the election, Four Corners recruited a group of undecided voters oh, yeah. down the barrel to give us their insights into the contenders. Are recording? It's just a bit of political theatre. I'm tired of him. I'm tired of looking at him, actually. We went back to them throughout the campaign. The people are angry with certain things which the government has been doing or has not been doing. There are a lot of complex issues that need to be tackled, but instead a lot of the on-air time and what we see circulating around the media is the gaffes and the pokes at each other. Hi, how are you? Now they make their final call. And we hear from political insiders who unpack the strategy, tactics and motivations of this hard-fought campaign. They've wargamed really well. They were well across their brief. They were ready. They had key lines ready to go. If you're not living in the marginal electorate, you are seeing a very different election campaign to everyone else. It's going to get messy. It's going to get ugly. It's going to get dirty. Uh, you're going to see all sorts of accusations, finger pointing, buckets of political excrement poured on people. Tonight on Four Corners, we go beyond the gaffes and gotchas and look at the crucial moments of the 2022 election, the ones that mattered most to voters. We join both campaigns as they traverse the nation and analyse what worked, what went wrong and how we got here. Tonight, as we gather... When the Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, took to his feet to deliver his fourth budget, he presented a plan for the Coalition's return to power. Mr Speaker, this is not a time to change course. This is a time to stick to our plan. That was, for me, the starter's gun of the campaign. It didn't frighten anyone. The market didn't sort of panic one way or another. So it didn't unsettle the electorate, so they were probably quite pleased with that. Did it score any major punches? No. Did it distract people from some of the brutality that's going on at the moment in politics for a couple of hours? Yes. Only until 9 o'clock, of course, when we had the, um, the uh, Fiverrenti Wells um, uh, contribution. He is adept at running with the foxes and hunting with the hounds lacking the moral compass and having no conscience. His actions conflict with his portrayal as a man of faith. He has used his so-called faith as a marketing advantage. After being dropped down the Coalition's Senate ticket, Conchetta Ferravanti-Wells chose budget night to savage the Prime Minister. 
putting Scott Morrison's character front and centre. By now, you might be getting the picture that Morrison is not interested in the rules-based order. It is his way or the highway. An autocrat, a bully who has no moral compass. This is not a Prime Minister for the people. He's also... He is a bully, and I back the Senator up completely with that. My first thoughts were, oh my gosh, not again. And it's, wow, it's that, that it leaves a bit of a, an issue with credibility and trust with the, with the PM, in my view. Character is, means a lot to me as far as who I'm going to vote for because that means integrity and honesty. Uh, it, if you haven't got that, then then you're not going to get my vote. When you see this lack of discipline in parties at these incredibly critical times, um, it shows, um, if you like, um, a weakness, a tiredness. It's almost like it's uh, a dying government at the moment and the party needs to be reinvigorated. That's what you're relying on. Get out of your way. Let me talk. OK, this is what you said when you got elected last time. We're going to help all those people that worked all their lives, paid their taxes, and those that have a go will get a go. Well, I've had a go, mate. I've worked for my life and paid my taxes. The people are angry with certain things which the government has been doing or has not been doing. And that is coming out very clearly in these campaigns because after the elections, they will not reach out to the people at all. They will not come to the pubs. They will not intermingle with normal people. So this is the chance for normal people to get back to them and to voice their concerns about the community. I'll put you on the spot on the first question. Who's going to win? I've always thought the coalition had a really good chance because the, the election, the six-week election, would define the opposition leader in a way that um, the government hadn't been able to do in the lead-up to the election. Once you get into the campaign, it's head-to-head. -head. I think Albo's in front now. If Albo has a strong campaign, uh, I think he'll be Prime Minister. I think if he has a mediocre campaign or a poor campaign, I think Scott Morrison will retain the Prime Ministership. You always have setbacks. You always have imperfect information. I mean, things are tough. As the campaign proper began, the Coalition's TV advertising was ready to go, portraying a kinder, more reflective Prime Minister. There's pandemic. There is now war. The rhetoric there was, for me, a lot of it was on what we've done, not what we're doing. Which, you know, you, you come through a pandemic and you expect a little bit of that, I guess. But the, the big message for me is economy. 40,000 people are alive in Australia today because of the way we manage the pandemic. Well, I, thought, I thought in that ad he actually came through more likeable than I've seen him for a long time. Interesting they scan back and show his wedding ring. What was that about? Was that some sort of... I don't know, what was that for? Look, I think that was a fantastic piece of political um, theatre. I thought it was really well delivered. Um, and I think that um, they you know, had obviously researched it and polled it um, within an inch of its life. The only thing that I thought was um, stuck to me a little bit was We're they focused on that wedding ring and that just they held it, I think, just a little bit too long. Australians deserve a Prime Minister who shows up, who takes responsibility and who works with people. Labor's campaign ad spruiked Anthony Albanese's credentials challenging the coalition refrain that he was weak on the economy. I'm Anthony Albanese, graduating in economics at Sydney Uni and serving six years as infrastructure minister, taught me what makes our economy tick and I will make it... OK, see, for me, that's a great campaign ad because they're telling us what they're going to do. The only thing I would pick out of that is him introducing himself, is that too late in the game to be introducing who he is? Shouldn't we already know that that's who he is? Just as the campaign kicked off, Anthony Albanese had a shocker. National unemployment rate at the moment is uh, 
I think it's 5.4, uh, sorry. I, I'm not sure what it is. Yeah. Mr. Albanese? I'm not sure what it is. Mr. Yeah. Mr. Albanese? Mr. Albanese? Come on. What do you think? Well, even I knew that. I'm not a politician, but I'm, a, I'm across that, and I knew it was 4%, so that's pretty unforgivable, that. And that's not a, a game changer for me. That's not going to make me turn around and say, well, no, I don't want to vote for him because he couldn't get the numbers correct. Thanks very much. Thank you. You would have been able to detect the jaws hitting the floor from about 150 staffers on the Richter scale. In, in technical, political terms, it would have been a sphincter loosening moment for the campaign director. Uh, look, it was um, hand on face emoji, um, sort of you know, yelled. The thing that was so disappointing was it played exactly into the, um, into the coalition's narrative. You know, weakness on economy and, and those sorts of matters. It, literally, it was the worst possible error that could have happened at that time. In contrast to his rival, Scott Morrison proved yet again he was adept at batting away tricky questions, like his failure to create a federal anti-corruption body. The Refining Integrity Commission, yeah. are you committing to it? Yeah. Is it a well, you asked me about priorities, and I'll, I'll talk about what my priorities are. Jobs, 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 and jobs. That's what my priority is. What was his answer? Jobs, 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 jobs. He just didn't answer the question. He's done this all along for months on end. Try to ask him, someone asked him a direct question and he'll just deflect it. At the end of the first week of the campaign, it seemed like Anthony Albanese couldn't take a trick. The man that represents the working class people is with me tonight. Would you please give Anthony Albanese Come here for entertainment. We didn't pay for political propaganda up on stage. So I think that was a fail on that part. Uh, to be perfectly honest with you, actually, I was a little bit disappointed. I, I thought that the crowd could have been a little bit more respectful as to, to who he is and to what he's doing. The next morning, as the media boarded the Albanese bus, the first polls of the campaign showed Labor's primary vote slipping. Riley? Yeah. Adam? Harvey? Oh, Adam yes, Harvey? Yes. Brian? Yep. Richard? Yep. Tristan and Sarah, everyone seems to have their poker face on, that's for sure, but it seems that the mood is a little bit solemn. Anthony Albanese, this poll is not looking good for him or for the opposition. With Labor taking aim at the coalition over climate change and its response to natural disasters, the team steered a course to a street of flood-damaged homes. And on floods, we saw again a political response rather than a human response, rather than looking at people who were going through a really tough time and saying, what can we do to help? The Labor team are trying to get people to look back, think about the things that have gone wrong, that Morrison, he didn't hold a hose or he didn't get the vaccine rollout right or he didn't get the rats right. You know, um, they want people to look at that and actually get, you know, um, galvanised that they won't reward that. While a rattled Anthony Albanese wanted to talk about floods, the journalists on the campaign trail had other ideas hammering him on the detail of his health policy. Do you not know how many nurses you need These your won't be run by the government. The charge is that you're not across the detail, Mr Albanese. Thanks very much. Mr Albanese. 99% of what you're doing in a political office and in a campaign is really actually trying to influence the questions, not have the right answer. And I actually say to people, you want to know how a campaign's going? Don't listen to what the politicians are saying. Listen to the questions that are getting asked, because that will tell you where the momentum of the campaign is. 
After a terrible first week, Anthony Albanese's campaign seemed at risk of slipping away. The next day, he picked himself up and came out fighting. Well, I've been underestimated my whole life. My whole life has been one whereby I haven't got a leg up. Uh, I've fought for everything that I've got. Mr Albanese, you can't get away from the fact that voters are still struggling to find reasons to elect you. How are you going to deal with that? How are you going to give them reasons when they say they don't know who you are or what you'll do when you become Prime Minister? It's a cracker of a reason right here. Right here. This is about the future. This is about what the government denies. Big di difference between myself and my opponent. My opponent is running on fear and scare. What Thanks very much. Thank you. Mr. Albanese, what evidence Thank you. Do you have? Good evening and welcome to the Sky News Courier Mail People's Forum coming to you live from the Gabba. I didn't watch the debate, I have to admit. I have never watched a debate. Um, I don't think it's useful, productive, it's just a bit of political theatre. Hello. I have a four-year-old autistic son. In their first debate, both men were keen to show their human side. But the Prime Minister's efforts to empathise with the mother of an autistic boy backfired. The Prime Minister. Yeah. Well, thank you, Catherine. What's your son's name? Ethan. Ethan. He's four. He's four. I can't... I, I, Jenny and I have been blessed. We've got two children that don't, haven't had to go through that. To say that, oh, well, I'm blessed that I didn't have disabled children. <sighs> That, that's dreadful. I'm sure he did. I'm certain he didn't mean that. In my mind, I feel like he didn't mean that, but look, he said it, didn't he? I think there were definitely uh, times in the debate that um, Mr Albanese really had it over Mr Morrison. And I think I have learnt more about him after watching the debate, just to get it, you know, more of an idea about who he is and what he stands for. <laughs> The day after the debate, Anthony Albanese tested positive to COVID and had to go into isolation. Anthony Albanese in ISO, how are you feeling? Uh, good afternoon, Fran. Well, I've, I've had better days. A lot of I think when the story of this campaign's written, the, the week that Anthony Albanese caught COVID is probably going to be considered the most significant and important event in the whole campaign because to me, during that week, somehow that's that's where the momentum begin, began to shift. And it was a momentum driven mostly by what Scott Morrison was doing and who Scott Morrison is, not what the Labor Party and what, not what the Labor Party was doing and who Anthony, Al Anthony Albanese is. And that's why that, that forced isolation was such an important hinge moment in the campaign. Thanks very much, Marin, and it's great to be here. Defence is traditionally one of the coalition's strong points, but a shock deal between China and the Solomon Islands turned this notion on its head. On Mr Morrison's watch, we have a security pact in the Pacific for the first time in Australia's history since World War II, uh, and that has demonstrably made Australia the region less secure and Australians less secure, okay. yes. Because obviously I'm of Chinese descent, but at the same time with all the talk and the tension going on with the Ukraine-Russian war and talks about you know China potentially ramping up it from a military perspective, and with this being quite close to home, given that they could establish a naval base, um, this is something that is quite close to home. Um, that's something that I feel could have been handled, or at least taken more seriously by our government. The other safe zone for the coalition is usually the economy. But now, there's trouble there too. Wages were flat and the cost of living was soaring, with inflation now running at 5.1%. But jumping to a 20-year high is not what was expected. So it was very pretty surprising to me. The thing is that inflation is... People might not understand the economics of inflation and interest rates and the Reserve Bank and all, you know, it gets all a bit too hard. But they do know that when they go to the supermarket, things cost more. Cost of living has made the economy front and centre of this campaign. From now to election, this will be the focus. This is not a time to roll the dice on fake independence 
a weak Labor leader and the chaos of a hung parliament. Are there any questions? Treasurer Josh Frydenberg had more to defend than the economy. His own inner Melbourne seat was under threat from one of the teal independents challenging moderate Liberal MPs. Yes, you know, it's a big challenge for the government, these independents, for a number of reasons. One is they're keeping some of their best performers, like Josh Frydenberg, keeping them in the seat because they've got to win that seat. But the other um, area is that these women are talking about cost of living, they're talking about climate change, they're talking about key issues which women are wanting to hear and wanting to vote on. The campaign advertising had a familiar negative refrain. That's not my job. That's not my job. It's not my job to do that. Voters were presented with a flawed Prime Minister and an opposition leader not up to the job. It won't be easy under Albanese. I am warming towards Elbow um, rather than Scott Morrison, simply because he seems to be a little bit more like you and me, a little bit more of the ordinary Australian. Look, it's uh, the jury's still out. You know, I'm, I'm, a li I'm a liberal voter, but I think the current leader is a liar and a bully and has issues with women. How can I vote there? With that's really tough. But I don't think the opposition is strong enough. I'm concerned about the economy. I think the campaign at this stage can go either way, quite, quite frankly. It reminds me a lot of the 2004 campaign where there was a high degree of undecided voters going into the last week of the campaign. How are you, Mark? Good, good. How are you? And their hesitations crystallised around Mark Latham's handshake of John Howard. And suddenly their hesitations were realised into a vote. I think that process of cognitising, deciding who they're going to vote for has really begun in earnest now. They're making very sophisticated decisions, but not decisions based on what's your kind of what's in your press release or what's in your big policy document. They're reacting to small things. Well, what did I feel? What, what, what emotion did it create in me when I saw you kind of at an Australia Day or ceremony or when you walked into a bunch of protesters and you weren't expecting them? They're making very sophisticated, layered decisions. The Prime Minister's energy for campaigning seemed boundless. <laughs> From a multicultural meet and greet... <laughs> ..to tea and sympathy with pensioners. There are many things that are uncertain at the moment. <laughs> ..to a quick game of pool. <laughs> Scott Morrison's maxim seemed to be, if you work hard enough, things will eventually break your way. Oh! What they're really doing is everything is controlled and everything is about what they need to win and hold certain seats. So if you're not living in a marginal electorate, you are seeing a very different election campaign to everyone else. In addition to that, we're announcing today $23 million for eSafety Schools package. It seems so far that this campaign has been about Small issues, small ideas, small announcements. Where are the big policies that'll give this the vast amount of undecided voters a reason to vote for you as opposed to just not voting for Labor? I, I couldn't disagree with you more. I really couldn't. Owning a home, paying for medicines that you need, an economy which has brought unemployment down to 4%, keeping apprentices in their jobs and getting the skills training that they need. Australians being able to save for their retirement. These are not small issues. On the same day the ALP launched its campaign in Perth, the Coalition held a rally of its own in a made-for-television moment designed to energise the party faithful. No blues fest booze here. This invitation only crowd had been fired up. Yeah. 
It's great to be here with Greater Western Sydney. How good? How good? How good? How good? So. There was one person here out of her comfort zone, the Prime Minister's hand-picked candidate for the seat of Warringah. Catherine Deves caused a media storm over her offensive commentary about transgender people and her push to exclude them from women's sports. <sighs> yeah, look, re really, really hurtful things, comments. Yes, I appreciate she's deleted those comments, but uh, look, it's a very sensitive issue. I think it was very, very inappropriate and very, uh, I guess, um, offensive to a lot of people. I myself know a transgender person and she's absolutely lovely. But would I want that person playing in a sport against my daughter? Maybe, maybe not. There is a difference in the abilities. But Catherine Deves had been placed in the front row where there was no easy escape. Outside the smoke and noise and heat of, of the debate that's going on in the, in the papers, there's a lot of people right across Australia that have some sympathy to that view. Look, this is a branding exercise. The way the Liberal Party have let this run is because they think it serves their brand well. And where their brand may be taking in water is uh, the competition from the right. So whether it's One Nation, whether it's the Clive Palmers, whether it's the Christian groups, what they've done through this act, letting this discussion and this um, uh, activity run and not shutting her down is to signal to these groups, I've got your back and, you know, I, have the, I share your conservative views and conservative concerns. Tonight, the end of record low interest rates. The RBA then came the news the coalition was dreading. At the worst possible time, a small interest rate rise grabbed the attention of the nation. The emergency low cash rate has been raised by a quarter of a percentage point to 0.35. Costs are rising, wages are flat and interest rates are going up. A Prime Minister who falls back every day on his economic credentials, who criticises the opposition leader for economic illiteracy, now finds the economy his greatest threat. Good afternoon. Joined by the Treasurer. Australians have been preparing for this, and as a result, the bank has, de has decided to increase the catch rate by 25 basis points. Australians have been preparing for this for some time. A surprise, but not to be unexpected. I don't think either political party, whoever would have been in power at the time, would have had much control over what the Reserve Bank has gone ahead and done. Well, when I bought my first house, I would think I was paying about 14 or 15 per cent. So, um, you know, I think they've had it pretty good for a very long time. The challenge for both sides, and particularly for the coalition, has to get has been to get voters to look through the initial shock of a rate rise to the the issue of who's better to manage the economy. Facing a press pack on a quest for another gotcha, Anthony Albanese had another stumble. What are the six Mr. Mr. Albanese? Policy, Mr. Albanese? No, One of your now, that's shot right. That's not right. Are these the six points that's here that have to right. be handed to you by your advisor? That's not right. Yeah. You, you've just been handed the six no. points, Mr Albanese. What are they? Our policy on so the NDIS... Just, so just is, confirm, you've just been handed... ...is to defend and fix the NDIS, lifting the NDIA staffing cap, doubling existing funding for advocacy, fixing regional access and stopping You did waste. not on the end of and your own waste. policy, Mr. No, we did. It's to put people at the centre of the NDIS. On the NDIS. I think it's just pressure, to be honest. I think a lot of it comes down to the fact that 
every the the pressure's on him. Like I, I would say, there's more pressure on him than there is on Scott Morrison. And once you have journo's that are that are keen on sort of uh, heightening that into the the moments they've seen, they sense a bit of blood in the water. So you 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 just have you know a, a whole range of things that could go wrong. Well, Australia is about to decide who will lead us for the next three years. But right now... With 13 days to go, almost a million people tuned in to watch the contenders slug it out in the second debate. No, we didn't. The federal government had absolutely oh. no authority over that sale whatsoever. Over territories. No, we didn't. Over Not over the sale of, of territory-owned assets of that the nature. Federal government. I, I, think, I, I think, get, I think we're getting more questions between the two of you than our panel. Excuse me, I think we're getting more questions between the two of you than our panel. no authority whatsoever. This is a very important... Yeah, so that was a very electrifying debate. It was very confrontational and fiery and I was quite surprised to see how, you know, energetic and amped up uh, both uh, Anthony Albanese and Scott Morrison were. So I was a little disappointed to see that they were arguing a bit too hard for us to sometimes make clear sense of what they were saying. There was frustration among voters over the lack of serious discussion about the issues that mattered to them. There are a lot of complex issues that need to be tackled, but instead a lot of the on-air time and what we see circulating around the media is the gaffes and the pokes at each other. So I think there could be a bit less of that and more focus on actual you know, hard action plans, um, policies and how they're going to target things. The big issues that, that I'm concerned about, neither of them are really embracing. I reckon every country in the in the you know civilized world has, has moved on far far further than we have on renewable. It's it's shocking, really. The tide seemed to be turning. Anthony Albanese was finally cutting through. It's in that white knuckle time where you know I don't know, and probably both parties don't know. I suppose if you look at the public polling, it it, it generally has. Uh, Anthony Albanese in front, but we all know public polling and what happened last time, so uh, anything can happen. And as you'll probably recall, 13% of people at the last election made up their mind in the booth, so there's still quite a way to go in this election and, and uh, it's probably anyone's to win from here, depending on how the campaign teams perform and, and the leaders perform. It's gonna get messy, it's gonna get ugly, it's gonna get dirty. Uh, you're going to see all sorts of accusations, finger pointing, buckets of political excrement poured on people, all that sort of stuff. Particularly, I think, you know, we are heading now. I think it's clear there is a, a very real chance there's going to be a change of government. The coalition only have one path to victory now, and that is literally to chop Albo's head off with some sort of either overwhelming negative campaign or some major stumble or mistake that they can ram home. An increasingly confident Anthony Albanese made a bold statement in support of a significant increase in the minimum wage. You said you don't want people to go backwards. Does that mean you would support a wage hike of at least 5.1% just to keep up with inflation? Absolutely. Mr Albanese showed yesterday that he is a complete loose unit on this stuff. He just runs off. He just runs off at the mouth. I mean, it's like he just unzips his head and he just lets everything fall on the table. That is no way to run economy because that only leads, if you vote Labor, to having a leader who can make interest rates worse, who can make inflation worse. If there's going to be inflation, well then I think wages should uh, follow suit because how on earth are we going to continue to uh, pay for everything? I think giving a number was, was a really smart move from my point of view um, because it give, gave people some sort of definite idea about people being able to pay a decent wage for the work that they do. The economic conversation right now is about cost of living and for the, what Labor has been able to do is actually demonstrate that they understand that and have a plan for that through their response to the wage increase. 
After months of declaring that voters knew exactly who he was and what he stood for, the Prime Minister announced that he would take a fresh approach. I can be a bit of a bulldozer when it comes to issues. As we go into this next period, on the other side of this election, I know there are things that are going to have to change with the way I do things. Uh, Chita never changes his spots, so I don't expect him to change in any way. If he has realised this, why so late? If a person, he realises that he has made some mistake over the years, why are you standing at the brink of an election and saying that you will be a changed person going forward? Give a very warm welcome to the Prime Minister of Australia, Scott Morrison. A week before polling day, Scott Morrison needed something big to win over undecided voters. And that's why a re-elected coalition government will allow first home buyers to invest a responsible portion of their own superannuation savings into their first home. I know my daughter is in that situation, she's 28. She's a hard-working chef in Melbourne, can't get on the housing ladder, you know, saves up and saves up and then the goalposts move. So, you know, I, I, I am fully aware of, of how it sits with young people and other people, but I, I don't agree with it. I just think your super's for your retirement. As of now, it has got no, I mean, there's no logic of why the prices should be so high for the housing. And if people can dip into their super, then the first home buyers or even other people, they will definitely try to go into that and the bubble would go up and up, the prices will go. And once it bursts, everything would be shattered. I mean, even the people will lose their own superannuation, whatever they have for their retirement. So I don't think this is a long term effect would be good for this. The policy was attractive to people struggling to save a deposit. Opinion polls showed the coalition narrowing Labor's lead. If Scott Morrison remains as Prime Minister, how will he have done it? Well, he will have done it through running a very strong campaign, but most importantly, he would have done it because he announced a policy in the last week that captured the attention of undecided voters. This policy came from research, data analysis. Whose vote did they need to get to win? It will be very clever politics, whether it's good policies yet to be seen. In the final days, the master campaigner hit the suburbs to hammer home the message. This is what it's all about. This is the great aspiration of Australians. Anthony Albanese's final pitch, workers would be better off under Labor. If we give them one extra dollar an hour, the sky will fall in, according to this Prime Minister. And in my view, the people who are the lowest wage workers in this economy cannot afford to go backwards. Great. For the leaders, the last gasp of the campaign was a breathless tour of the nation. Barnstorming in marginal seats across six states, the exhausting final stretch of the path to power. Let's have a go. Even before election day, these undecided voters had seen enough to make up their minds. Okay, off you go. Adam Wotherspoon voted early for the Greens. Why? To put simply, I no longer have faith in Scott Morrison. I would go with Labour. I'm leaning towards the Labour Party. I'm looking more at Labour. So you're not voting for Labour, you're voting against the Coalition. That's right, yeah. I'm, I'm more voting against the Coalition than for Labour. I'd say that's correct, yes. I'm going to vote Greens. Greens? I've been a, a Liberal supporter my whole life and, and I, I want to say that that's not a... That's not a mindless Liberal voter. I, I've genuinely, in my heart here, always thought that that's what's been best for the country. That's not what's best for the country right now. I, I, I can't see what's going on in the party and their principles, and it's hard to get past the leader. 
You know, I know it's a, I know it's a whole set of people, but it is really hard to get past how I feel about Scott Morrison. So that, that's where that one's gone. Day finally arrived. There we go. Now you really to get that out of the way. Good. Go <laughs> one for the animals, second for your major party, both get a vote. Caleb Wu was the last of the group of undecided voters to make up his mind. Okay. Caleb, how goes? How'd you go? Yeah, so voted Labor. Why? Because I wanted to see a bit of change. I think with the recent um, news around Scott Morrison and you know his sort of plummeting popularity and things like that, I think I am ready for a change. Scott Morrison admitted himself that the way that he dealt with things could be different. So after three years, you would have expected somebody to you know have already gotten things right, I guess. So you know, if we want something different, then a different government. Please welcome to the stage the man set to be the 31st Prime Minister of Australia. Six hours after the polls closed, Anthony Albanese took centre stage. We have made history tonight. And tomorrow, together, we begin the work of building a better future. A better future for all Australians. Thank you very much. After the election, political insiders assessed the massive recalibration of Australian politics. OK, Sue, so what happened on Saturday? Uh, the people spoke. <laughs> what did they say? They said, you're not listening. So if you won't give us what we need in terms of government and the policies that we want, we'll make our own decisions. And that's what happened. We've heard for years that, you know, the inner city, you know, our the inner city bubble, you know, latte drinkers, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you know, that disdain shown for those people has obviously bitten them on the bum. What were women saying in particular? Women were just talking common sense. Women were saying, hey, you know, you're not listening to us in the policy settings. You know, childcare, um, aged care. Women are saying, we need to be back in the workforce. Women are saying, um, and not just women, obviously, parents are saying, my kids, my future, we've got climate change, it's a problem. You know, there are all of these common sense policies that people were just not listening to, and so they activated it. Anthony Albanese now has the nation's top job. But the huge third party vote in this election has unearthed a deep dissatisfaction with the political mainstream. Well, Australia's fundamentally been realigned. That's what happened on Saturday, uh, in a way that I don't think anyone could have quite imagined. Um, you've had historically low primary votes for both major parties, primary votes that would normally never see you form government. Um, I think the Liberal Party is on about 35% primary, and, and Labor has one government 
with a primary vote of 32 per cent, um, almost a hundred year low. What is very clear is voters wanted something new and they wanted something different and they demanded that. It's very, very interesting. We look at that independent and minor party vote. That is extremely unusual. I don't think there's any doubt that, that Scott, the style of politics that Scott Morrison pursued and his intransigence on those three issues, gender, climate and integrity, was a really a massive accelerant on that process. Um, and it's a big and fundamental kind of shift in voting patterns that we haven't seen in Australia in a very long time. And that's all for this week from Four Corners. Until next week, good night.